Delta Airlines often ranks as the top U.S. airline. Let's put it to the ultimate test on one of its most premium routes, Delta One service from Seattle to New York. Hello, Jet Setters. I'm Jeb Brooks from greenergrass.com. Right now I'm in Seattle. I need to make my way over to JFK. I've not been flying Delta very much lately, and there are a lot of reasons for that I'll share in this video. But it's time to check them out. So join me as we fly Delta One across the country to JFK. The flight was scheduled to take about four and a half hours, covering about 2,400 miles at an altitude of 39,000 feet. But first things first, though, what's Delta One? Well, it's not the same as Delta's first class. Instead, according to the airline, it's one of the most exclusive cabins in the sky with a dedicated in-cabin flight attendant and luxurious details that truly make the difference in how you spend your time in the air. Basically, it's elevated service in lie-flat seats on wide-body aircraft serving international and a handful of domestic city pairs. Unlike regular first-class passengers, those traveling in Delta One can enter the Sky Clubs and receive upgraded amenities like pillows and blankets, not to mention much nicer meals than you might see in regular first-class. But let's get this trip started to see how Delta delivers this supposedly elevated experience. After a quick check-in at the dedicated Delta One counter and a short walk through the terminal, I headed to the Sky Club. Now this club is beautiful, maybe the most visually appealing one in the whole system, certainly one of my favorites. If you want to learn more about the Seattle airport, don't miss last week's video where we went behind the scenes here. There's a link in the description below to Airports Revealed. I'm facing a little bit of a challenge. Um, our inbound aircraft uh, came in to New York last night from Tel Aviv and was due to fly here to Seattle about five hours ago. It's only leaving New York now. Everything still shows on time for us, so maybe there'll be an aircraft swap or some kind of miracle. Uh, but uh, regardless, this is just uh, the, the, the trials and tribulations of travel. And as I waited for news about our flight, I grabbed some breakfast. It's so nice to have hot food on a buffet return to Sky Clubs. I have to say, the food tasted better than it looks and I was grateful for the fantastic views as I watched the world come and go from SEA and waited to discover my own fate. Looks like we got that much needed miracle. They just swapped our aircraft for one coming in from uh, Tokyo. This is an advantage of flying out of a hub like Seattle. Well, that combined with the size of Delta's fleet it's feasible to swap aircraft at the last minute like this. Anyway, I headed over to the South Satellite to watch the wide body taxi in. Delta added these A330 900 Neos to the fleet in part because of their latest generation engines burning 25% less fuel than older airplanes. The airline also touted the vast improvement in every cabin on board. I was on the very first revenue flight for Delta with the type from Seattle to Shanghai back in 2019, and I was really impressed. Of course, that was before the pandemic turned the airline industry on its head, so I was really looking forward to seeing what the experience on board would be like today. But I haven't been flying Delta much lately. There are really three main reasons for that. First, uh, the schedule's just been reduced. Where I live in Greensboro, North Carolina, we've seen service cut, capacity cut, far longer uh, than with United and American. So it just hasn't been as easy to book flights with Delta. Their schedules just involve, often involve really painful uh, connections, either really long or really short. Uh, the second is that uh, the cost is often significantly higher to fly Delta than the other airlines, even with my third reason, which is reduced service. So a lot of the service cuts that Delta have made are understandable uh, and, and make sense. Some of them not so much. Uh, so I'm really excited to try this flight to see if the Delta that I love is back. Despite that potential delay, boarding was on time. And my seat, 6A, looked perfect for this transcontinental flight. Even numbered seats on the windows provide more privacy than the odd numbered ones on this aircraft. I'll share some more observations about the middle seats in a bit. As I mentioned, I first flew this airplane on its inaugural trip from here in Seattle to Shanghai, so this wasn't a completely new to me setting. That said, it never fails to impress. The color palette just feels right, and setting foot inside a Delta One cabin always feels like coming home. The seat itself is full of features designed to make the in-flight experience more comfortable. 
You'll find a large touchscreen for IFE and plenty of legroom and storage in front of you. There are headphones and a spot for a water bottle, but speaking of service cuts, I had to supply my own. The seat has tons of adjustments. Power is accessible through a USB and a universal power plug. There's also a headphone jack, of course. This shelf is tremendously useful as it provides space for a laptop, even when you're using the tray table to eat. There are adjustments for the seat when you're in lie flat mode too. Now, the shoulder harness proved to be a challenge. I couldn't get it to move, and because each passenger in this cabin has to have a functioning shoulder harness in order for the flight to go, I alerted a flight attendant that mine was broken. She spoke to the captain. Calling maintenance on it now. Moral of the story, you see something, say something early. Uh, the more time, the better. Between the time I notified the flight attendant and maintenance arrived, 30 minutes passed. At one point, I offered to switch seats for taxi takeoff and landing, but that never seemed to gain any traction. Thankfully, once he arrived, it took almost no time for the maintenance professional to fix the issue, and the jet bridge pulled back only about 12 minutes late. Flight time, four hours and 23 minutes. Uh, fast flight uh, plan today. Looks at uh, possibly arriving into New York about uh, 30 to 45 minutes early. Welcome on board. And we'd need that extra time because while the delayed pushback may have been my fault, the plane's computer was not ready to leave Seattle either. Takeoff data the computer that gives us the speeds for takeoff is not uh, doing what we wanted to do, so we're having the company send us uh, new data over the data link. I should be here in just a couple of minutes. We'll put that data and be on our way, so just a few more minutes. Uh, sorry for the delay. And he was right. It didn't take too long. All that said, with a huge shout out to the maintenance and dispatch professionals, not to mention our flight crew, and of course favorable winds, and the people who pad the schedules, despite leaving Seattle 45 minutes late, we got into New York 32 minutes early. Now I was grateful for the information from the cockpit about that delay. I wish more crews would prioritize communication with regard to delays. I know they're busy diagnosing and fixing mechanical and technical faults, but just a quick update goes a long way. Once we were in the air, I removed the shoulder harness and said a little prayer that it would work before landing. And then I checked out the in-flight entertainment. It was smooth, worked well, and offered a reasonable number of choices. Not as many as it used to, though. The upgraded moving map feature is a welcome addition. Now, this is great IFE, especially when compared with the American Airlines system I'd used just a few days before. Even though this was a daytime flight, I was grateful for the plush pillow and blanket, both from Weston. I pulled out the medium-sized, sturdy tray table and opened up my laptop to catch up on some work. I couldn't get my laptop to work on the internet, but my phone connected without any problem. Unfortunately, I had to work on emails and access to the internet for the full flight cost a whopping $34. My hands were tied and I paid it. But thankfully, it was blazing fast. Now, about those middle seats, they have a barrier that between them that can be lowered or raised, depending on whether you know your seatmate. Unfortunately, the barrier between 6C and G was broken. But further, flight attendants couldn't get the door in 6C to close. Based on reports I've seen from other frequent Delta flyers, the Delta One seats on the A330neos have not withstood the test of time as well as other seats in the fleet. The struggles of my neighbor across the aisle, not to mention my own seatbelt, seem to validate these stories. Were I Delta, I might go back to the manufacturer for some recompense, but that's not for me to say. Soon, a snack service was pre presented along with drinks. I chose to have a glass of red wine, which was very nice. Soft drinks, juices, and even liquor were available too. This is a step forward to Delta, who used to limit drinks to beer, wine, or water. Exactly one week before the flight, you'll receive an email inviting you to pre-select your meal from a list of three options. When faced with a decision of cauliflower cakes, chicken, or beef brisket, my choice was clear. The food was really good, but the corn pudding was the unquestioned star of this show. It was creamy and rich and paired with the brisket perfectly. This was certainly one of the most memorable in-flight meals I've seen in quite a long time. Delta are very slowly returning catering to their roots. At one point pre-2020, they had some of the best food in the sky, 
and you could count on something filling on nearly every Delta flight. That's just not the case anymore. Although it is better than it was last year when you just got a snack box. But check out this meal I was given on a recent first class flight from San Francisco to Atlanta, similar in length to this flight from Seattle to New York. But as a reminder, because it wasn't labeled Delta One, you don't get the upgraded meal. A lot of people say the airline is pinching pennies or using current conditions as an excuse to cut costs. Well, that might be part of the equation here. From what I understand, much of the challenge relates to labor shortages and catering suppliers. Regardless of the cause, I was grateful to have a flavorful and filling meal on this four and a half hour flight. A walk through the cabin reveals 168 main cabin seats between 17 and 18 inches wide with 31 to 33 inches of pitch. You'll find 56 Delta Comfort Plus seats with a similar width and 34 inches of pitch. Premium Select offers 28 seats with 18 and a half inches of width and 38 inches of pitch. Up in Delta One, there are 29 seats with up to 22 and a half inches of width and a bed that lays out at 76 inches. This is, this is fairly narrow, uh, but it would certainly suffice on an overnight flight, which of course is what it's designed for. It's nice to have it on this short daytime flight, but uh, other than the seat belt, a couple of problems with some neighbor's seats, it's a pretty nice design. I feel very fortunate to have a seat like this on a flight this short. With about an hour left in flight, flight attendants walked around offering snacks and another drink service. As we began our approach, I nervously reached for the shoulder harness relief. The sun was setting as we came into JFK, and I reflected on this flight. It's time for the Jeb score. In this unscientific, completely subjective way, I'll rate this flight on five factors, each on a scale of zero to five stars. We'll look at the lounge, the seat, the food, the in-flight entertainment, and the service. First, the lounge. It's great. I'd say one of the best lounges in Delta's entire system. But as nice as it is, it can't compare to the Alaska Lounge in the North Satellite. That said, it's great to see hot food available again, and the environment and views at the SEA Sky Club are quite nice. This is a four-star lounge. Now, for the seat. Well, I mean, it's tough to ignore the fact that it broke and delayed our departure. The mechanic who worked on it said it's not an uncommon problem. Plus, I can't ignore the two other seats with broken components, a barrier and a door. And this is also very disappointing because when I first flew in this seat, I gave it four stars, but I just can't do that after this trip. As well-designed and beautiful as it was, it did not work as intended. Yeah, it was comfortable, and yes, I am always beyond grateful for a bed in the sky, but this seat only earns two stars. The food was great. As I mentioned, it ranks as one of the most memorable meals on a flight in a long time. I'll give this five stars. And if you want those five stars, just be sure you're booked on a route with Delta One service. Otherwise, you'll see bare bones food or nothing at all. The entertainment was solid, and unlike American Airlines, it actually worked. I wish the internet was a bit easier to use and, dare I say, less expensive. But overall, the IFE earns four stars in this flight. Finally, the service. And this is really where I struggle. Hear me out. In the past, I, I really loved Delta because you could always count on five-star service. The cabin crews were fantastic. They spent virtually every minute of every flight up in the aisles checking on passengers. Maybe Delta's headquarters in Atlanta meant a culture infused with Southern hospitality. But I've noticed that over-the-top warmth and friendliness has faded away and it's just less reliable. Now, there are a lot of understandable reasons for this. Corporate mandates, reducing the amount of time flight attendants can interact with passengers. Crew fatigue. Fear of getting sick. Unacceptable passenger behavior. Senior crew retirements. But put simply, when it comes to today's Delta, I miss the predictable, consistent, great service. But I was so glad that this crew were fantastic and their great service should not be colored by negative experiences I've had with other crew. This was five-star service. So that leaves Delta One from Seattle to JFK on the A330neo with 20 out of 25 stars. Between now and the next time, see in the sky. <laughs>